Okay, so I'm I'm going to start by um, introducing Garfield, and I, I'll introduce myself. My name is Sarah Faulkner. I'm a teacher with the York Region District School Board, and I sit on the um, executive for OHASTA and have been a uh, part of the conference planning committee as well. Um, I am in York Region sitting on the cusp of two important treaties in this area, the Toronto Purchase and the Williams Treaties. Uh, and one of the commitments that we've made in my department um, at uh, Unionville High School has been to teach our students and learn with our students uh, about uh, our land acknowledgement that we use in York Region and to uh, then take that learning and weave it through our history courses. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be introducing uh, Garfield. He was my professor at Boise, and I have to say that so much of my um, thinking as a history educator is definitely grounded in, in Garfield's work. So Garfield is uh, an associate professor at the Department of Curriculum, teaching and learning at OISE, the University of Toronto. Uh, he explores how to teach through sustained critical inquiry while nurturing deep conceptual understanding and genuine competence. Uh, Garfield's work with thousands of teachers, just like me, across grades and subjects, uh, helping them to frame learning and engaging uh, and provocative activities with rich, authentic assessments, which is my favorite line whenever I'm working with the people in my department is going back to the idea of authentic historical assessment. Currently, Garfield is engaged with schools across Canada, in South America, and in Europe. And over the past two decades, requests for his services have taken him from Asia to the Middle East, uh, Europe, the Caribbean, and across North America. His interest in effective teaching and learning has led him to actively explore the challenges and opportunities presented by teaching and learning in the digital age. Uh, in addition to his work at the University of Toronto and delivering workshops, Garfield has also authored several articles, chapters and books and seven textbooks uh, and has taught in the faculties of education at York University and the University of British Columbia. His most recent book co-authored with Ronald Case, Creating Thinking Classrooms, has received widespread praise from leading educators across, across Canada and internationally. So welcome Garfield and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Sarah, and it's great to see you. Uh, my teaching began, as you probably know, in York Region, I hate to say how many years ago, I think 36 or seven. Uh, so been gone from a lot for a while. Um, by the way, just wanted to, uh, little heads up in case there's some interest. Yesterday, I launched a, a global inquiry with um, grade one to four students and, and our, our driving question is how similar or different is fall uh, where I live compared to other parts of the world? And, and and I'll tell you in a moment why I'm telling you this when all of you are higher age. But so we have students in schools from China, Korea, Krakow, Prague, Uganda, Peru, Mexico, Ontario, Alberta, Manitoba, and Akalawi participating. And the children will be using Google Slides to upload images of their environment and activities they do in the fall and foods they eat in the fall and, and they'll compare and make decisions. Anyway, why am, I, why am I telling you this when you're teaching higher grades? I'm, if you might be interested, please let me know because I'm beginning to put together a global inquiry into climate change. And that will be for more middle school, like six, seven to you know, grade 10 kind of thing to get kids around the world from schools in China and Korea, um, Africa, South America, North America, to compare the impact that climate change is having in their area. I, I work with indigenous communities in, in the Andes and Peru, having a huge impact there. And I thought it'd be great to get students talking to students. Um, well, that'd be great, Rachel, if, uh, if we had Sri Lanka. Like the more we can get in and kids, you know, take a picture of your backyard, show us what's happening. What's your government doing? What changes are making? What could you do? And just and use Zoom and use Google Slides and so on. Anyway, if any of you are interested in possibly let, let me know. And I'm just starting to build a, you know, a list of people. And if we get it off the ground, uh, you know, we just send emails out. And, and the nice thing for you as a teacher, if you want to get involved, all the slides that kind of queue up the questions and the activities, and that will be set. So uh, it might uh, 
might save you some planning time as well. So the idea is to give teachers a bit of a break, connect kids around the world, get them talking. Anyway, that has nothing to do with today directly, but I just thought I'd float it out there just in case we have, like, I just love the fact that right away, I've got some possible Sri Lanka interest, uh, Chilean interest, people more locally. That's fabulous. Anyway, uh, as I said, stay in touch. And I will, when I say that, uh, Sarah, can you just let me know that you can see my slide? No problem. It's perfect. Ah, perfect. Thank you. So uh, I will try uh, to revisit the same information at the end of, of the presentation. Uh, but I did want you to take note. My email is there. My Twitter is there. If you see something that interests you, I make a comment. You want to follow up on a global inquiry. Um, that's how you can get in touch with me. So you, you can you can drop me an email, you can direct message me on Twitter, whatever it might be. But again, I'll revisit this at the end to make sure if you want to be in touch that, that you can be in touch. Um, I'm going to try to get through a lot of material, but I wanted to start because uh, the talk today is, is around assessment um, and how do we assess for thinking. And, and I wanted to show you just you know, thinking about the groups of the provinces that are involved in the conference, I want you to note, when I look at, you know, what is the purpose of assessment? This is from the Galileo Project in Alberta. Assessment is to improve student learning. Uh, Manitoba, the ministry, assessment is to improve student learning. Or sorry, Ontario, the growing success. Manitoba, enhance teaching and improve student learning. And while I don't disagree with that, I think what's missing in these statements uh, is a piece around, um, and, and I'm thinking about this kind of as we start to hopefully emerge from the pandemic, how do we reignite a, an excitement for learning? How do we reignite a passion for learning for kids? Uh, not just how do we measure curricular outcomes, but, but how do we ignite a passion? I did a, a talk uh, on Thursday in Winnipeg. Um, one of my talks was on assessment as kindness. So it's not this talk, but it was, you know, I also have been thinking lately, how do we better use assessment as a positive tool in our repertoire, not one that creates stress and anxiety for kids? Which leads me to this piece. I, I teach a graduate course in assessment at, at OISE. And a few years ago, I kind of reorganized my course around these kind of three broad principles or ideas. And my argument is that assessment should inspire inform and sustain learning. Uh, which of those three terms do you think my students pretty routinely are, are puzzled or surprised by? Which, which, do, you, which, which do you think? Because of those three terms, there's, there's one of them that generally gets a, a, a puzzled response from people. They, anyone want to take a stab at which one it is? Yeah, you're absolutely right. You guys, it was to inspire. I get people saying, um, you know, I asked my, my son who's 30, I said, when you were in school, you know, what do you think? Would, would this describe assessment? And he always says, inspire. He said, it created anxiety, it stressed me. He said, but I never really thought of it as an inspiration. And, and I thought, well, that's, that's unfortunate. Anyway, I wanna to try to touch on, you know, if we're using assessment really effectively, and by the way, I, I heard you know, a course being developed, the, the, the Adventures in World History as a locally developed and what you're doing there. It sounds like that fits with the Inspire. Like I wanna see kids excited to do my task, not stressed by it. So I wanna start um, connecting back to that earlier slide that I said, like, what is the purpose of assessment? And you notice all of them said the primary purpose is to improve student learning. I, I want to try tweaking that or offering an alternative view that, in my view, the primary purpose of assessment isn't around improving learning as measured against curricular outcomes. To me, it's to cultivate learner agency. It's to make our, our children strong, independent thinkers. And, and I want you to note when I use the term learner agency, and in part, I'm borrowing some say from the OECD recent report on, on Education 2030, where they, they remind us that agency has two key elements, the will or desire to learn and the capacity to learn. And I think often, you know, we agency gets kind of stopped at um, giving kids a choice that, you know, learner agency is about letting kids decide what they want to learn. And I, I want to challenge that a little bit by saying, uh, I, I think good teaching Yes, it may give, I think it needs to help students feel included, see value, see meaning, 
But I also think good, good learning uh, opens kids' eyes to things. I, I did a, a TED talk in Waterloo, I don't know, about five years ago on inspiring awe and wonder. And, and my argument was that school should be a place that opens students' eyes to a world that they may be unfamiliar with. That, that it's not just saying to kids, what do you want to learn about? But it's about getting kids to think about you know, music and authors and art that I, I wasn't even aware of. Uh, it's about inspiring kids to want to, you know, when I grow up, I want to travel there. I want to see that. I, I'm curious, uh, would anyone mind in the, in the chat, were there any authors, music, artists, or travel destinations that you were turned on by, by a teacher at some point in, you know, whether university or, or elementary or high school, anyone have something where, you know, because of a teacher, I've always wanted to see this, go here, I got turned on to this author, anyone have examples of that where because of a teacher, I was inspired to want to do, anyone have an example? Because I think that's an important part of what we do, especially in history and the social sciences is to say, you know, there is a, a fascinating world out there in history. Oh, sure, that's fascinating, the, the Japanese history. Yeah. So Dan, are you saying Victor Hugo is the, your route into wanting to travel places? Is, is that what, I, what I'm seeing? Oh, okay, yeah. I'm going to, so you guys are confirming for me that, you know, when, when we're really doing our job well, it's not just about saying to kids, what do you want to learn? It's opening doors. That they have. I never knew I'd find that so fascinating. Uh, so that's the first part. So one of the parts of, of agency is the will or desire to learn that I've, you know, because of your course, you've got me excited about. But the other part, whether it's saying to kids, what would you be interested in learning or what have I excited you to learn about? If we don't build children's capacity to do the learning, even giving them choice, it still falls flat because I don't know how to ask rich questions. I don't know how to learn for depth. I don't know how to sift and sort. Yesterday, I, I did a, a talk at a BC conference on curatorial thinking about how do we frame learning in ways that kids become curators of both the sources, the questions they ask, the evidence, and how they share that. And what, what does a curatorial approach look like? And it's about building capacity. So how do we both excite kids to want to learn, but then give them the tools so that learning can be successful? And I want to start with that, the first half of that, that that's the inspire kids to want to learn. And remember, I said, I, I think rich assessments can get kids excited. So I just want to offer a couple of thoughts, but I'm really hoping you stay active in the chat and, and we share some thoughts. But one of the things that kind of frames my thinking is I was thinking about how do I how do I create authentic? And someone said, you know, uh, I like to think about authentic learning. And I got to think about, well, there are two important dimensions or elements of authentic learning. And the one that's most often talked about is product and performance. So it's, you know, we often want to think about what will I get kids to do uh, or what will, what perform, what will they create or perform that is authentic in nature. So that's my bottom axis that you'll see. So from fake to real and, and, that's thinking about what will kids do. But my other axis, because I think this one gets overlooked too often, is, but who's your audience or what's the purpose? Is it authentic? Or am I doing the product and performance just to get marks? So how do we, how do we take a product or performance and give it an authentic purpose or audience? And we'll talk about that. And in thinking about that, it led me to these four quadrants. So the bottom left quadrant is what I call fake, fake, learning that's fake, fake. And fake, fake, like I'm going to say, you know, testing is what schools have you do. Um, I understand they're gatekeepers to higher learning, they're efficient ways to gather some, some evidence of learning, but they're not what you do in life. I mean, I think most of us would agree, you write very few, once you've graduated, you don't write a whole lot of tests. I mean, there might be an occasional driver's test or something like that, but for the most part, testing is what schools make you do. It's not what you do in life. Now, when I move, uh, let's say move to the right, and I've got the real fake, the yellow. Um, uh, Kelly, that's a great point. <laughs> that when it's fake, fake, you're trying, what do teachers want and how do I give it back to them so I get the mark that I want? But it's not valuable to me. That's playing, the, you, you've nailed it. Like that's playing the game of school. We're in the fake, fake there, right? Um, yeah, and this is on the test. When we move over into that yellow, 
you know, and I'm calling it real fake. You've got an authentic task, but the only audience, and by the way, and I, you know, I was guilty of this at times where I would have kids build some great models and it was more authentic than a test, but the models came in, they sat at the back of my class. Eventually I marked them and then I sent them home. There was no audience. They, the kids were building the model for me. Uh, I remember reading, um, uh, a Twitter and, and someone said, you know, I said to my student the other day, but you know, I, I, there's no sense of an authentic audience in your writing. And the student's answer was, well, I've never written for an audience. I've only just ever written for a teacher. And, and I, that really kind of stuck with me is like, you know, what do you want me to write? How am I supposed to write it? So I want to look for when I do have that authentic task, how do I bump it up? So there's an authentic audience. I'll give you a, a couple of quick examples. Um, Many of us in all of our provinces, we have a spiraling curriculum. Um, and that spiraling curriculum, often you'll, you'll look at, say, civics in grade five in Ontario or grade six in Alberta. You know, you'll look at it in one grade, and then you'll visit it again later. You'll look at early civilizations in grade four, and then you'll look at it again, you know, potentially in grade 11. Well, imagine if our grade 11 students were given the challenge of developing an informative and engaging display about an ancient civilization, but their audience is the grade four class in the local feeder school. You have to develop a display that will engage and inform grade fours because you're going to the feeder school and putting it up for them to learn from. So now all of a sudden you're communicating something with a real audience and a real purpose behind it. Uh, so if we can think of opportunities, and I'll talk about some more in a moment. My fake reel, this is where I've got an audience. So, you know, we're having a history fair and kids go out and uh, gather a bunch of research on an event, let's say they stick it on a three panel display and they're done. Yeah, but that's not really doing history. You just gathered a bunch of information, put it on a board, and then you shared it with an authentic audience. What would it look like if that history fair was actually doing the discipline, it was doing history? So how do I take something where, okay, we've got an audience, but they're not actually engaged deeply in the doing. So when I play in the blue area, it's saying, how can I take, uh, we used to have students create a philosophy magazine and everything they were learning in philosophy, they used to write feature articles, movie reviews, book reviews, and they published them. But those magazines were then, they also had to sell advertising space in their magazine to local cafes who would then want a copy. So they had an audience, your magazine is going out into the community. So I look for ways, can I just, can I take that really interesting task, interesting task? My guess is many of you are already doing really interesting tasks, but you may, and it'd be great if you post in the chat, you may be thinking, yeah, you're right. You know, I could just get that out into the community and bump it up a level. My experience has been when kids have a real audience, they get pumped and, and it stops being, is this what you want? I'll tell you a really quick example. Um, teaching a politics course a number of years ago, we had students, we said, I don't want you to just, you know, you guys be the liberals, you guys be the NDP. No, you guys are going to create your own party. And they had a, you know, we did a, a you know, kids did a quiz to figure out where they were in the political spectrum. They created groups. They had to come up with a party platform, a party logo. Um, they, they nominated within their group, who's going to be your candidate, who's going to be your campaign manager, who's going to take, and they all took on these authentic roles. And there happened to be an election that year. And like many schools, we had an all candidates debate. So, you know, the liberals, the conservatives, the NDP, the various parties came into the all candidates debate. But also on stage were three of the parties that my students created. And they debated with, now this was a number of years ago, and some of you may remember, but Al Palladini was on the stage. At a different time, we had Eleanor Kaplan there. But the major political parties were up on stage and interspersed for my students, also in suits, well prepared with their notes. That audience, you know, when we gave them that authentic audience, and by the way, the grade 10s were the, um, the grade 10 civic were the audience that came in to listen. The kids, the performance was outstanding. Um, so I'm just reading uh, comments as they come as well. Yeah, Kelly, I love that. So sharing the territorial acknowledgement, not just with your school, but why not the feeder school or clubs or teams? Out? So that's your authentic audience and moves us into that blue. Anyway, I want just to show you this to think about like, what are you already doing that you may say, I've got a great task that sits in the yellow, but I could share that by getting it out into the school community. I could get that beyond, like, by the way, was, I have to tell you with, um, 
the internet has just made this so much easier to put stuff out there. You know, in an English class, instead of having kids write something about a novel to give to you for you to mark, what if they're blogging about it? So others are actually reading it and you've got that authentic audience. What if kids are creating a podcast and they're, and they're posting their podcast uh, you know, after you've vetted it and support them and so on. So I think there are lots and lots of ways. By the way, my global climate change idea is trying to play in the blue. So as you're developing these ideas, you know, they're thinking about how they're gonna share this with others. Anyway, I wanted just to share that with you as a, as a thought. And, and here, here's a kind of example. This is my last field trip before I left the classroom a number of years ago. I was teaching an ancient history course. Um, and I said to the kids the first week, by the way, I think this would work so well in your world history course that, that we talked about earlier. Uh, I told the kids the first week, a month from now, we're going to the beach to build sandcastles. And the kids had to pick an ancient site that they think is like they have to be able to justify it as an important representation of uh, the, the civilization. So they, you, know, you have to pick a site, but you have to be able to justify the selection of that site as an important um, representation. So the kids picked, I'll come back to that in a moment, the, the girls on the left that you see that are digging there in the sand. By the way, this is the beach by the Humber, where the Humber River uh, in Toronto kind of goes into Lake Ontario. The kids are digging out what will become the Greek theater of Epidaurus. Uh, the bottom right is the uh, Roman bath complex. In the top at the back, you can see uh, an Aztec pyramid in the background. Um, in the four kind, of, kind of foreground center left, those kids are building what will become about a six foot long, three, three to four feet high Great Sphinx. Uh, the kids had from, we got there at 10 o'clock with their shovels and buckets. They had from 10 o'clock till two o'clock to build the most impressive reproduction in sand that they could, okay? They were pumped, but I want you to know their authentic audience, I had invited the local media. CTV showed up. They actually let off the weather that night uh, with a, the kids there, the local newspapers showed up. The kids didn't even want to stop for lunch. They knew that at, at two o'clock, media's coming in. Uh, there were going to be trophies given out. Now, I want to go back to an assessment lens. I couldn't care less if you're a good sand sculptor. It's not in the curriculum. It's not what I'm measuring. Remember, I said this is the first week of my course. And the students, I wanted them to learn how to ask good questions, find a reliable set of sources, gather useful information, both written and visual, and learn to collaborate so they can pull off this project. And that was my, that were my, those were my learning goals. The sand sculpting has just got kids excited. It's what had them willing to commit to it. By the way, in the winter, we would do this in snow. You know, we just go out and you're gonna build snow sculptures of, of ancient sites. By the way, the next unit, the kids built off of that. Okay, we've been talking about asking good questions, finding reliable sources, gathering notes. But now you're going to use that to write a movie review on a movie, a, a relevant movie with in a historical theme, if, if it's history or geography. And eventually you're going to use, because now you have to develop a thesis, you have to use that evidence, and later we'll move towards writing a paper. Anyway, that's what I mean by uh, giving kids an authentic audience that just bumps up uh, their excitement. You know, another piece that I want you to think about in terms of the, the moving from fake, fake to real, real. Um, finding ways to make learning relevant. You know, um, how do we get kids to see that what they're learning has value to them? You know, an example you know, that, that I've, I've used is getting kids to think about, you know, in civics, you know, what if I got kids thinking about within their lifetime, it is very likely that a settlement may get established on Mars. And you see a lot of stuff around the science that's necessary to get us to Mars, to get a settlement established on Mars. And my, you know, my favorite line in The Martian is when Matt Damon realizes he's stranded on Mars and he says, oh, I'm going to have to science the crap out of this. And I thought, I love that line. But in my class in civics, it's going to be, you know what, if we're going to establish a settlement on Mars, we're going to have to civics the crap out of this. You can't just put, you know, five or 10,000 people on Mars in a settlement and not have thought about how will decisions be made? How will power be shared? Imagine if civics, you know, in Alberta, where you do in grade six, you do Athenian democracy, the Iroquois Confederacy, Canadian democracy. Imagine if kids said, everything we learn about governance and civics, what are we getting right and what are we getting wrong? And your challenge in my course is to 
create a, a set of advice to be sent to Elon Musk. If you manage to get a settlement on Mars, here's what we recommend on the governance. Don't make this mistake. This seems to work well. So I'm trying to frame it around now. You get to establish the government for a future settlement. What would it be? Um, I also want to just touch on as a way to frame, you know, real, real learning, authentic learning. Uh, how many of you have heard from your kids at times, like, why do I need to learn this history? Because their sense is, you know, history lies in the past. What's it got to do with me? Is that is that a, a comment, a question you sometimes get from your kids? Yeah, I think it's a, a common word, kids. By the way, I, I, you know, I get that less if they're doing history that they find really fascinating, but you know, sometimes we're, you know, we have to do confederation or, or whatever. And, and you know, I mean, I have graduate work in history and I don't find confederation that interesting. So you know, how do we get kids to, to see value in it? And I don't know if you're familiar with this term or this idea, but something I've been playing with over the last about year is this idea of prospective thinking. It's not perspective, but prospective thinking. And prospective thinking means looking forward. It's imagining possible scenarios in the future, but it's imagining those possibilities, those possible scenarios based on trends from the past. So given what we know from the past and given what we know about, the, about today, given the data we have available, what are the possible futures and how do we build to have the best future that we can? So project, uh, prospective thinkers, look at trends from the past, lessons from the past, and use them to make ongoing decisions to try to create the best future. Um, you know, the best example I can give of this is had we paid closer attention, if we were truly prospective thinkers, we probably would have learned more from the Spanish flu or from SARS and been better prepared for this pandemic, had been able to respond quicker. Uh, if we use prospective thinking coming out of this pandemic, we will build better systems for the next pandemic. So it's thinking about that. And by the way, you'll notice that so, so prospective thinking is kind of on thinking about or building memories of the future. So it's, it's saying, what, what are the historical memories and how can they be used? And I think about this because it strikes me that if I can show kids, by the way, let me show you an example. This would be a critical thinking question. If I were to ask, uh, you know, was Henry VIII, uh, an effective leader or an effective ruler? Is Henry VIII an effective ruler? That's a critical thinking question. I build criteria for an effective ruler. I gather evidence about Henry VIII. I would then decide whether he was highly effective, somewhat effective or ineffective. As a prospective question, I would be asking, what are the most important insights we can garner from the rule of Henry VIII? What, what should we look for in effective leaders? What should we be cautioned against? How do I use my understanding of past leaders to inform the decisions I want to make going forward about who I want leading us in the future? Uh, Kelly, I think that's a wonderful, wonderful prospective question that you have. Is Canada on track to being the country we desire? That is a wonderful question. And then getting kids to say, look, everything we look at in this course is going to be what can we learn about, you know, the 1930s were a tough decade. What can we learn from how we responded in the past to say, you know, should we have another economic downturn? How do we avoid the, the, the hardship that we experienced before? What lessons does history have to teach us? This is a way for me that, that, that there's not a, a lesson I could teach that I would teach in my history class where I couldn't respond to a student's question. Why am I learning this? Because if we learn, by the way, you'll notice, let me just pull up one other piece. By framing learning around perspective thinking, you're teaching for transfer because you're not teaching. So you, you memorized events from the period of Henry VIII or from the beginning of the 20th century. You're teaching so kids can understand. And if you go to my bottom there, you're teaching from a more conceptual space that allows kids to say, oh, I'm, I'm learning a conceptual lesson that allows me to take that learning and use it in new context. It engages me, of course, both in critical, but notice the creativity element here. So how will you use that learning in interesting and innovative? History is not gonna repeat itself. History does not repeat itself, but there are trends and we can respond to those in creative ways. It ensures that kids are meaning making. They're not just memorizing. And, and it's getting at 
learner agency because it's, you know, what, you know, notice Kelly's question. What is the country you desire? And what are you going to do to help build it? And how is history going to inform your decisions? Uh, Rachel, love how you tweak that. Who was the greatest hero? That's a critical thinking question. But if you make that a prospective question as you've done, what are the most important quotes? As we look at some of the pharaohs of the past, which inform us about the qualities we want to look for in a state leader? All right, so now that's prospective. But if I leave it sitting in the past, okay, so we're in debate, you know, three, three different pharaohs, who is the best? But framed in your second way, it becomes a prospective question. So I just want to raise that with you as a, a way to help create that learning that is real, real, right? So when we look at real, real learning, they see value in it. All right. Um, in the second half that we have um, uh, together, I, I wanted to look at, because today is about assessing for thinking, and I want to look at, at five keys, five ideas that can help us. And by the way, one of the most common questions I have from people who, who engage in work in critical thinking is it, it's very, very common that people get excited by the work, they enjoy the work, the kids enjoy critical thinking. And invariably, I'll get the question, okay, this is great, but how do I assess it? And what kind of underpins that question is, it's easier to mark for correctness than it is for soundness. And by the way, notice the shift that I'm implying here, that what we need to be doing is moving our practice from, I don't care about whether your answers are correct or incorrect. I care about your ability to use evidence to build a sound answer. So how do we get at um, soundness? Uh, Kelly, I think that's a great point you made. So I'm, I'm bouncing back to my slides and, and, the, and the chat about uh, the creativity. I, I do a, a graduate course at, at OIZ, well, across U of T, on uh, creativity and sustained inquiry. And I have to tell you, I'm delighted to see that in, in most cases, it's not dominated. I, I mean, I'm glad to have arts people in it, but it's so nice when I see I have science students I, I had someone from the law faculty uh, in the course, you know, I get humanities history student to see that the powerful role that creativity plays. Anyway, uh, these are five ways that I want to suggest that might help us focus the quality of our tasks and the, uh, the learning that we're doing in ways that make it. And by the way, the three things I've been looking for lately coming out of the pandemic, I want to tell you, I'm looking for framing learning that engages kids, that leads to deeper learning and makes teacher workload more manageable, okay? Because if I just focus on the first two, you know, how can I create more engaging lessons that kids are getting deeper in their learning and it's doubling my workload? It's just not gonna happen. I think we have to balance the well-being and, and igniting. I'm thinking about how do we reignite learning for teachers and students? So these are things I'm hoping help us approach learning in the history and social sciences in ways that kids get excited, that the learning gets deeper, and my work gets a bit lighter. So some of you may have seen over the years I, this idea of a cascading curriculum, and I'm getting a sense of we do, but I'll just quickly touch on it. You'll notice, uh, by the way, this one is designed, the examples I'm gonna show you are really designed um, So I just want to pause because Daniel, I think you're raising a really good question here. Um, would you mind jumping on the mic and just, just expanding a wee bit? Because I think it's a really important question uh, and I don't want to ignore it or state. Uh, sorry, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it actually happened at, a, I believe, at a faculty in Texas, a, a teacher education faculty, where one of the supervisors had asked, um, one of the teacher candidates to come up with opposing views or an activity which involved an opposing views on the Holocaust. Um, and of, of course, that led to a whole series of events after in terms of the... So my point is, is that there's... there's I, I love critical thinking and I explore and I'm very... I, I allow for lateral thinking and diverse answers, but sometimes things are wrong. Yep. Right. And um, I seldom say things are right. I, I, by rule, I never say a student is wrong yep. unless they, there's a limit. 
right? And I said, well, let's explore where you're going with it and where did that come from? And then I encourage them to rethink and say, well, is there another view that you could come up with and so on? Yeah, so Daniel, let me, and I, I think it's a great example. Um, and I think what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't wanna ever frame a question in my class that invites students to debate whether or not the Holocaust was an acceptable event in any way. I don't want to invite the question about, you know, this would be, a, I think, a parallel. Were Indigenous people traded poorly or well in the 19th century? Uh, first of all, I think that's a pseudo-critical thinking question. I actually think there are times, I, I call them pseudo because they sound like critical thinking questions. They sound like, well, you're giving me a choice and I get to argue it. Um, the Holocaust, there, there, there is no sound argument to be made that you can defend it. Um, Residential schools uh, cannot be defended. Like, I don't think there's a body of evidence that allows. But, huh, can, sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. I, I, with due respect, yeah. um, I brought this issue up regarding, let's say, for example, a law course, and we talk about genocide. We look at Lemkin's definition of genocide. Yeah. And then if you ask students to, you know, does the residential school or the treatment of Canada's Indigenous people account or uh, meet the genocide standards? And that's somewhat of a thinking question because you have to evaluate the criteria and apply the criteria and then look at the evidence and, and see if it, if it does fulfill that. Um, but some people said, no, you can't even argue that's a genocide. It's a genocide and that's it. And they should be, it's sort of like they brought up the example of Louis Riel. Yeah. So why are we even arguing that Louis Riel uh, was a traitor or not? He wasn't, right? And I say, well, so the students who are exploring it, they need to assess the evidence to make that decision on their own. Yeah, I think those are a good example. Let me just, if you don't mind, I'm gonna just quickly give another example of, if I have a question that I think, uh, I'm gonna use the treatment of indigenous people as my example for a moment. I actually don't want kids debating whether what was done to indigenous people was acceptable or not, because the, that just opens up all kinds of problematic, I mean, for them to defend what happened is going to be to get into racist and dangerous. But I also don't want to just indoctrinate kids with indigenous people treated badly, you just have to accept that. So you notice the conundrum we have is, okay, well, I, I you don't want me debating this, but then I just have, so let me give you as a quick example. Here's my critical thinking question. Which of the four factors, we give kids four factors that lead to conflict, power, greed, cultural misunderstanding or outright prejudice of some kind. And we ask kids to create a pie graph. To what degree did each of these contribute to the mistreatment? So in the Holocaust example, look, we know the Holocaust happened. We know 6 million Jews were killed. What factors played the most important role in allowing that to happen? What, how did we allow, how did this break down? Let's debate that. Let's not debate whether or not the Holocaust can ever be justified. No, it can't be. But there's lots of room to debate how do we prevent it in the future? And so anyway, I do think there are ways we can take areas that are problematic like this and find a critically thoughtful spin on it. And, and it's a, but it's a good, I'm so glad you raised that because it's a really important point. Sorry, I'm just, I also came on in time. Um, so looking at my cascade, you'll see here, I've got a, what I call a through line question. And my through line question for my course, um, you know, considering Canada's 150 now, what, 154, 55, uh, what should we celebrate and what should we commemorate? That's going to run through my course. And throughout my course, you're going to gather, you're going to be creating a media source. I don't care if you want to do that as a video, as a podcast, as a series of artifacts, you can, you can decide. But you have to capture the highlights and lowlights of Canada's 150 years. Every major event or period we look at, you're going to debate so is that a period to celebrate or commemorate? You'll notice to make it more manageable, I break it down, now in this case, it's into units. As we explore World War I, this is the Ontario curriculum, when we look at World War I in the 20s, the question driving this unit, were the costs of war and the benefits of prosperity shared equally? Did some suffer more than others? Um, you know, how, how do we look at that? And then how does that add, what are the highlights and lowlights from that period? Did we handle the adversity of the depression in World War II well or poorly? What evidence are you gathering? What are the highlights and lowlights? And so on. So I know, you notice what I'm doing is I'm taking that big question and then I'm starting to sequence a series of questions and each unit will yield a little more advice and feedback in. Uh, I'm just gonna show you um, 
Another example, you know, more maybe around a world history course. If I ask students, what are the most important lessons we can learn from the past that will help us to create a more sustainable and prosperous future? So I might be looking at, you know, a world history course. And the through line question is, what lessons does the past have to teach us? And by the way, here I've got write an essay, but sometimes I've used this and I'm thinking about the world history course we talked about you know, before the session began. I had kids build a museum exhibit where they had to you know, have two or three artifacts from each of the lines of inquiry. So first we're gonna look at lessons that can be learned about how past civilizations have interacted with their natural environment. And you know, you say, pick three images that show how the environment played an important role in the health of early civilizations. That goes into your resource. Um, now I want you, so especially if you're doing a museum, now I want you to look at you know, living in harmony. We're gonna look at uh, conflict and, and compromise and how do we live in harmony? What lessons can we learn through conflicts that could have been avoided? Um, where do we see examples of it? We're, and using RAFs, role, audience, format, topic, strong verb, students are gonna craft a letter from a character in the past, prospectively writing a future warning on mistakes we made don't do this if you want harmony. That goes into my overarching challenge. You know, looking at lessons around the arts can inspire and what visuals can create a visual that shows that and so on. Anyway, uh, so what I'm showing you here is using a cascade can help us take a, a big rich question that kids live with over time. The depth of learning comes from them continually being able to revisit, dig a little deeper, add to it, change their mind over time and so on. The second part is, so if I've got that rich question, then what's my learning launch? And, and what I mean by a learning launch, and I'll just uh, move to the next slide for that. So a, a learning launch in terms of assessment. So often we might talk about um, hooks or minds on activities. And I want to distinguish what I'm calling a learning launch. And, and some of you may use what you call a hook in the same way, but I find often hooks are kind of fun activities that we do at the beginning of a lesson with students that uh, you know gets the brains warmed up and then we move on and it's kind of forgotten about. Uh, what I mean by a learning launch is an, an invitation and an opportunity for students to start their thinking immediately, to weigh in, by the way, it's a great diagnostic. I see what kids think, what they think they know, what their misconceptions are, but we're gonna revisit this launch. It's gonna be used multiple times. We're gonna keep coming back and saying, Given what you've now learned, would you change your position on that? Uh, if you're not changing your position, how does your new learning um, enhance what you thought? So learning launches are, are provocations, but they connect to iterative learning. Okay, so it connects to opportunities to revisit. So I'm gonna show you some quick examples. Um, I call this one a dashboard. My examples, by the way, aren't always high school and they're not always history, but I want, I'd love again in the chat, if you can go, oh, I could use a dashboard for, or maybe you already are. This was a, a grade seven class learning about um, the organ systems in the human body. And the question the teacher began with uh, right off the bat is Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, is Groot more plant or animal? Now, by the way, you'll notice my aversion to binary questions. I don't want to ask, is he a plant or is he an animal? Because that doesn't set up the nuanced responses that allow me to shift a little bit. Is he more plant or more animal-like? By the way, if you have no idea, I, I'm really not sure. Um, <laughs> Jason, expand on, he is Groot. Uh, by the way, I love what you said there because in the first Guardians of the Galaxy, they say, well, I love using this, um, nobody knows what Groot is. And so when the kids say, well, we'll Google it. Well, good luck, because nobody knows what Groot is. There's no answer for this. You have to use what evidence. If you really don't know, leave it right in the middle. And I know where I'm starting with. you. When kids say, oh, he's definitely more animal. Good, tell me why. By the way, notice I'm starting to get an insight into what you know about the organ systems in the human body, what you understand about biology. As we start to learn about the digestive system, we pause, we go, so now what do you think? Are you still convinced he's more animal than he is plant? Well, I'm a bit less convinced. I'm going to dial it back a little bit. Well, what, what changed your mind? Uh, the teacher told me, by the way, that the debates and discussion they had, she said it was great. The kids were vacillating back and forth as they'd learn about the respiratory system. And well, he does talk and he can't talk without a voice box, which requires, blah, blah, blah. and you just saw them debating, but it was the application that said it was beautiful. 
By the way, as I said, I don't have a lot of time, but I'd love if anyone's saying, oh, I could use a dashboard for, uh, if you have any thoughts, where, where would you use a dashboard in, in a class that you teach? Um, anyway, I'll show you a couple of others. And uh, you're getting a, a snippet of like four or five. I have like a dozen of these. I have a, a full PowerPoint just on learning launches with, you know, here's a blank one to save teachers time. Here's a blank one. If you like a confidence meter, here it is. Just substitute your title. Um, and here's two or three examples. Here's a dashboard. Here's three examples. Here's a blank one. So, uh, but we don't have time for all of those. So I'm just giving you a snippet. Confidence meter. Right off the bat, you come in, you say, so what's your position on this issue? Now, how confident are you? And so I might say, well, I'll take this position, but I'm like 40% confident because I'm not sure I know enough about it. And someone else might say, I'm quite confident. I'm, I'm sure. Okay. What do you need to hear that might bump up your confidence? What might you hear that might challenge your confidence? Oh, Daniel, like that. Should religion be allowed in the public sphere? All, by the way, notice if you're asking that as a dashboard, always, often, sometimes, seldom. So you want to create those range of spaces. And if you're not sure, you can take the middle. As we look at various arguments, are you, which way are you leaning now? Now where are you going? By the way, you notice how a confidence meter can dovetail into the dashboard as well. So you took a position on the dashboard, which I asked you to do. How confident are you in that position that you've taken? By the way, getting kids to physically line up when we're back in schools. You know, I want you to line up. Tell me why you're really confident. What, do you, what, what makes you so confident? Why are you less confident? Okay. We do a bit of learning. Teacher does a you know, teacher-led lecture, a reading. Okay, I want you to come back up to our confidence meter. Now, where are you? In a similar way, drawing a line. Where do you draw the line? So at what point, um, you know, Daniel, the question you asked earlier about genocide fits very nice on where do you draw the line on, on you know, at what point has, has a, 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 something crossed into genocide? At what point does the world have a moral obligation to step in? I mean, there is this difficult um, a debate that we have, like, do other countries have the right to step into our affairs? Well, I think internationally we do if we can show that a genocide is taking place. Uh, I think we have this debate going right now uh, in China, and, and Trudeau has been criticized for not taking a strong enough stance. Um, right? So where do we draw the line? Uh, uh, how bad does climate change have to get before you're willing to take action? So where do you draw the line is getting kids, giving them a variety of options along the line saying, so what if it's this? What if it's this? The whole Me Too movement is a where do you draw the line? At what point has that behavior gone from being, uh, you know, I think the New York mayor might say, what do you mean? I'm just a good old Italian guy. Uh, I, I was just being friendly. Well, at what point does friendly cross the line and say, no, that, that is sexual abuse in the office? What's the line? And getting kids to, to debate that. Uh, using a ranking ladder. Asking students, uh, this was a grade three class in Los Angeles, and you can see their question. What type of severe weather is most dangerous? By the way, you'll notice they need to unpack the criteria for dangerous. But as a launch, I don't unpack. I just start right off the bat and say, here are uh, five forms of extreme weather. Which do you think is most dangerous? And the kids voted. Then as they began to learn and they discussed some criteria and as the learning unfolded each day, the kids would be asked, do you still, do you wanna change your vote? Does anyone think differently now? By the way, I want you to know, I'm allowing kids to take a position and then eventually say, you know what? I don't think my answer is as sound as it should be. I don't think I'm right in this. We're moving kids from being afraid to answer a question because they might be wrong to say, no, every, and with a learning launch, take a position. Don't worry, we're gonna come back. We're gonna revisit it. Anyone think of a ranking ladder that you could use in your class? I, I, I've asked kids, you know, here are six factors impacting climate change. Put them on a ranking ladder from the one that's having the greatest impact to the fifth greatest impact. Great diagnostic. I know in five minutes what kids know, think they know, what misconceptions they have. As we learn, I'm going to invite you to go back to your ranking ladder, see if you want to change it. Talk to me about why you've changed it. So let me know if any of you have other thoughts around, oh, Linda, that's a good one. Here are five factors that influence the fall of Rome. Rank them from the most uh, impactful to, to fourth. Imagine if we take the causes of World War I, and instead of just memorizing Maine, what if we had to rank them from which one uh, had the biggest impact on leading to war to the fourth biggest? 
great. Rank order immigration policies. What are we looking for in or whatever it might be? Beautiful. Uh, this I mentioned before in the context of you know, what led to the Holocaust or what led to mistreatment of Indigenous people or others. A uh, high school teacher in Alberta asked, the, reframed it this way. He asked, who bears responsibility for World War II? Remember, this is a learning launch. Day one, kids, okay, we're going to be starting World War II. I want you to create a pie graph. Who, who's most responsible? So everyone had a role to play, but who had a big role? What's the, you know, this is an issue of culpability. And you, know, you can see from this one, well, Germany, the biggest, another, as you learn, kids might start to say, wait a minute, that Treaty of Versailles actually was really quite bad. Maybe more of that blame should go, yeah, responsibility for Great Depression. Who bears the responsibility? So by the way, when you know as a learning launch, kids divide it up. And if you really don't know, I've given you, uh, you know, seven contributors. You can divide it up into seven equal parts for now if you want. But as you learn, how would you adjust? And be able to, by the end, at the beginning, I just ask you to divide it. Do you have some reasons? If you're not really sure, that's okay. As we learn, you'll adjust, you'll justify, you'll defend your answer. Anyway, those are learning launches. I, I hope they're helpful. Uh, I have found, uh, uh, by the way, the a teacher I worked with in Los Angeles, she just started to put uh, when I went back to see her, she had a, a dashboard, a ranking ladder, a pie graph. Like she had five or six of these uh, learning launches, uh, you know, writ large on her walls. Like so, you walked into a room, and there are five or six of these learning launches. And each unit, she would just say, "This is going to be a good unit for a dashboard." And she'd put her question up there, and you'd walk in any day, and you'd see the evidence that's been emerging and the debates they've been having. You walk in the next day, you can see the shifts that are happening. Next unit, oh, this is a better one for a ranking ladder. And she'd have a ranking ladder up on the wall. So the kids just got accustomed to, you know, try out an answer, uh, revisit it. Now, I, I want to connect that to the idea of thought books. So a thought book, um, and I want to be really clear, a thought book is not a journal. And I intentionally avoid the word journal because journaling has a very entrenched place in education. And often we write journals, you know, after the fact, after your presentation, write a journal, uh, write a reflection on how it went or whatever it might be. Thought books are meant to promote re reflecting forward, not how did things go, but how does your new learning change your response? So it creates, as you can see in my slide here, an interplay between what I knew, what I thought I knew, and my new learning, and it gives kids a place to test out answers. So uh, I often show kids a, a variety. I say, look, the concept of thought books is not new. Um, da Vinci, Newton, Darwin, J.K. Rowling, Jim Morrison of the Doors. Like I have examples from all of them. You carried around a thought book. I, you know, they call it other things. They, but you just jot down ideas. You scribble notes. They're messy. You're allowed to think through. So the idea of a thought book is just giving kids a place to park their ideas. You know, do you think Canada is the country you want to be? Ask them that the first day in your thought book. Jot down some reasons you think it is or, is or it isn't. As we begin to work through the course, you're going to have a chance to go back and add a picture, add some words that are going to, hmm, now what are you thinking about it? Go park your ideas. I love that one teacher I was working with, in her notebook, the right-hand side was, you know, there was the title, the date. This is where she wrote notes. This is what she would study, you know, for a test. But the left side, remember that comment someone made earlier about the importance of creativity. The left side Whenever you have an aha moment, an insight, a thought that's going to help you respond to your rich task that we set up at the front, park it on the left side. And so the students, their thought book was actually integrated into the notebook. It was always the left-hand page. They could draw, they can make notes, they can be messy. Right? This is where your thinking is going. And this is where your notes are going. So really, really quickly from an assessment lens, thought books are assessment as learning because you'll notice Every lesson I teach, the first assessor is not me, it's the students. Because the first thing I'm doing is I'm saying, I want you to take a look in your thought book and I should think about what you initially thought. How's that changing? Make some notes. The assessment for learning, I encourage you never mark a thought book. It'll kill the learning, for, it'll kill its purpose. And don't take them home. Don't create more work for yourself. As kids are having a discussion with each other, working independently, I just wander by, I pick up a thought book, I leave through it, I take a quick look, I see what's developing, gives me insights. What are kids confused by? What's going well? 
Can I pair kids up? Should I stop and, and, and clarify something for the class? It allows me to do just-in-time feedback. And, and lastly, at the end, if the kid's end product isn't quite as good as they hoped. I had a student uh, building um, a model in, in ancient history, and she used plasticine to build this huge Roman model. And sadly, before she got into school, it had collapsed under its own weight. And it looked more like a Salvador Dali kind of painting slash sculpture than what she, and she was in tears because, oh my God, all that work and it's collapsed. And, and, and she was worried about her mark. And I said, don't worry about it. I have your thought book. I can see all of the thinking and learning that went into that because I have your thought book, not a problem. I never mark a thought book, but it helps to inform judgments. You know, that model you built, the model turned out okay, but your thought book shows me brilliant insights. I'm giving you an A minus, not a B plus. And I'm justifying it. Uh, by the way, this comment was made earlier again in that world history course. Thought books are wonderfully rich tools where kids park pictures, drawings, ideas, and they can inform our judgments. Hi, Garfield. I just want to give you a five minute warning. <laughs> I, I'm watching my clock going, ah, I'm running out of time. Thank you. Uh, I'll just show you two quick things to wrap us up. Um, I want to show you a guide to success. Um, and I have to preface this by saying I, I'm not a fan of rubrics. I find most rubrics are too vague. I always found it a waste of my time to write a level four and then change one word and make it level three and then change that word once more and call it a level two. And then I come to realize that most rubrics are written as scoring tools. They're designed, their primary purpose is that if all of us were marking some some papers, we'd have a basis from which we would score that assignment and it would give us some consistency. But they're generally not written as learning tools. They're not really designed to help kids. So this is what I mean by a guide to success. And uh, this one was developed with a grade 11 teacher in Alberta uh, using their curriculum in an English class for a critical analysis essay. But what I wanna show you just the key components. First, the left-hand column is what's required to complete the task, okay? So what do you need to do? You must have a thesis. You, your thesis has to address all parts. There cannot be, there can be three, but not more than five arguments, okay? If you have too few, I'll ask you to add another. Too many, I'll ask you to get rid of one. None of that is about the quality of your work. You could do everything in the left and do it all badly. The second column is what I'm looking for for you to achieve excellence. If you have all the pieces in the first column and they're done well in the second column, you're doing well. You'll notice the third column, it's not hand your work in and hold your breath and wait to see if I like it. It's you come to me and say, I've been working on this. I've got all the pieces. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with this, but I'm still struggling here. Could you give me some, some guidance? So this is about getting kids to help us identify where do you want uh, to target the support, okay? And then the teacher gives them guidance back. So uh, here's one for a museum exhibit. I have dozens of these. I've created generally with teachers. Let's just talk about what kids need to do to finish the task. What does it look like when they do excellence? And then how do we coach them? So uh, uh, we've had a lot of kids just loving these and finding them really helpful. My last thing in my last minute, pulling this stuff all together. Remember, I want to assess for quality thinking. So how do I make sure that the evidence students are gathering in my course is being used in a critically thoughtful way? So what I call a thinking organizer, again, I have probably a dozen different examples, but I'll just show you this. All thinking organizers share four key elements. They have a provocative question that, that gives purpose and focus to the lesson or to the learning that's going on. They always provide a set of criteria so my provocative question is going to ask you to make a judgment. I've got a set of criteria that we'll use that will help you make that decision and focus your thinking. There's always a place for students to um, record their evidence. You'll notice in this way, when you gather evidence, whether it's through my lecture, through a reading, through your own research, you're now organizing that evidence around the criteria. And in this example, is the evidence showing that your criteria is or is not being met? So if we go back to, you know, which Pharaoh was the most effective leader, what's your effective leader? What evidence are you having that Ramses II was an effective leader or was not? When I weigh that evidence, the fourth piece of any thinking organizer is what's the judgment I would make. 
So I'm just going to super quickly show you, you know, there are different structures. You know, there's the same one, but done with Henry VIII using criteria from Baldassare Castiglione for what makes a Renaissance man. What evidence can you find that Henry actually met or did not meet? By the way, this could fit for what, what constitutes a genocide. Here's the criteria. Is it being met or not met? If I want to create a museum, how do we decide what artifacts are worth keeping? Is it provocative, unique, informative, of exemplary quality? Why do I believe that? What evidence would I use? Making my selection. Is climate change a serious threat? I've built the dashboard now into this. Here's my criteria. I frame on my first bit of evidence. I thought this. I gather new evidence. I'm shifting my mind a bit. But you'll gain, you'll notice it's helping get organized evidence around criteria leading to a judgment. Using a fishbone in the head of the fish, what's your provocation? What's the criteria? On the bones of the fish, start to gather the evidence in light of the criteria to help you make a judgment. Thinking map in a very similar way, provocation at the center, criteria around the outside, gather evidence in light of the criteria to make a decision. We're out of time. Sorry, that was a quick rush through uh, five tools that I'm hoping are helpful. I promise to come back to, you know, there's my email. If you want to slow it. Okay, I I may be having uh, connectivity issues at the moment. I'm not sure if it's at my end or not. <laughs> um, I think there. we're back. I think, I think right. Garfield is back here. Okay. Um, as always, Garfield, thank you so much for your insight, for the way that you um, challenge us as teachers, no matter how experienced we are to rethink our practices, and in this case, in particular, our assessment practices, uh, to, to make our, our learning for our students so much more powerful and inspiring. So um, an absolute pleasure. A number of people have asked if you share your PowerPoint or not. Um, and so I thought I would ask you before we say that. Yeah, absolutely. So Sarah, I'm happy to, uh, as I said, you can email me individually. I'll send it back. If, if there's a place for um, posting it through OHASTA or other organizations that's more central, we can do that. Um, whatever, whatever works. Okay, thank you. I will send you an email and, and we'll see if we can get that set up. And uh, um, I don't know people... I'm asking for the email. I'm just going to take one second and pull it back up. So before people sign up, there's my email or my Twitter, if you want to be in touch for anything at all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, as I said earlier, I hope you have a great weekend and great rest of the conference. And, and if I can help in any way, let me know. And if you might have some interest in our global climate inquiry, let me know that so I can add you to my list of, of emails to get in touch when we get it up and go running. Wonderful. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.